Hey everybody, welcome to our Wednesday night service. We are glad that you are here. I've been uh, watching the uh, stream come in and getting those prayer requests in and uh, we're grateful for the good report that we've heard. And uh, so if you have a prayer request tonight, there's about a, oh, a 30 second delay for me. So uh, if I miss it, it's not on purpose. Well, depends on who it is. It might be on purpose. No, I'm kidding. But uh, we're so thankful that uh, you have joined us here tonight, and um, we want to go through a few of these things here. Uh, let's see, we have, very good, glad to hear that, Miss Laura, about Lindsay. We've been praying for her and her burns there, and uh, we heard a good report, if you've been looking at it, for uh, Brother Tim's mom she did have her treatment today and is doing well so we're grateful for that we want to continue to remember her in prayer and uh, we had a prayer request uh, that came through uh, our text list uh, of Janet Dilly this is a member of the Burns family that we definitely want to remember in prayer she has been diagnosed with brain cancer and uh, she is going to be going through some pretty rough uh, chemo treatments uh, coming up and so we want to remember her in prayer as well. Uh, we have any more come in while while we've been talking? Okay, uh, very good. We want to, of course, um, welcome you here as we are continuing our study of the mind of Christ. And uh, today we're going to continue talking about what it means to develop that mind. And I hope it'll be an encouragement to you. We've heard some great things and that this has uh, been a help. And uh, we're looking forward to our next phase of dealing with the COVID-19 virus. And of course, that means that this coming Sunday, we will have drive-in church. Now, you know it's official because we put it out on the church sign today. So now it's real. There's no turning back. And uh, we'll be having drive-in church. Now, I'm not going to go over everything with you uh, that we're going to be asking of you because we already have that posted. That video was posted last Saturday, I believe. And uh, it also now has been in written form today. And so be sure to go to our Facebook page to look at that video uh, that will explain everything about our drive-in service. And if you don't want to watch the video, then uh, it's all written out there for you. If you have any questions, please let us know and we'll do everything we can to help you uh, make it as easy as possible this coming Sunday. Uh, I want to remind you of a couple of things, though, uh, that, uh, first of all, if you're not comfortable coming, we will still live stream the service. And so uh, now we'll be outside. I can't guarantee exactly uh, how the service will go as far as our Wi-Fi service, but we're going to do the best that we can outside and uh, hope that uh, it will be good. And uh, we'll hopefully have good audio as well. Now, we're going to still have singing, and uh, we're going to still have uh, our praise team there, and we're looking forward to that. It's supposed to be beautiful weather, and so I'm thankful for that as well, at least for now. And uh, so we're going to begin at 11 a.m., and we're going to be done by 12. A couple things I want to remind you of, because I know how some of you are. You want to get here like at 7.30 in the morning, get your space. The only problem with that, though, is we've got to get set up. And that means we've got to put the cones out. And we've got to get everything lined up the way that we need. And so if you will wait and uh, come to the church uh, beginning about, we'll say we'll have the parking lot open uh, probably around 930. Okay, so between 930 and 10, give everybody plenty of time to get here. And we'll direct you to what spot uh, that uh, you'll need to be at. And I'm going to be set up. Uh, Brother TJ's let me borrow the uh, flatbed trailer there. We're going to be standing up uh, and it will be on the right corner of the auditorium as if you're looking from the road. And so that way we make the most out of uh, most of our parking. Okay. We would love for you to come. We need you to come. This is kind of where the rubber meets the road. We are going to get back together for church. And so unless you don't feel safe in your own car, away from everybody, we want you to come uh, and be a part of our church service. And you'll see some fun ways that you can participate uh, in the service. 
And uh, we want you here. We want you singing. We want you hearing the preaching. And uh, we'll be continuing in the book of Mark chapter 6. And so it's going to be great. And, and I'm looking forward to it. Can't wait to see y'all. And uh, we, but of course, we have to abide uh, by these guidelines. So remember, if you are a senior saint and you're not sure whether you're allowed to get out, just know that the coming to a drive-in service does not fall under the stay at place rule for you through June, okay? You're still allowed to come to church as long as you remain in your car, okay? So we want to let you know that. Uh, you say, well, how do you know? Well, that's, that's what we've been doing. We've been researching this for two months, trying to get the right story. However, if you still are not comfortable with that, I want you to feel the freedom to stay at home. And we're going to live stream as long as it takes until you can feel comfortable enough to come to God's house. That's what we want. That's the most important thing. We want you to enjoy getting back to church, okay? And then on May the 17th, so after this coming Sunday that we have drive-in service, I'm going to give you then our next phase. And that, of course, is getting back together uh, in the building uh, through, of course, the social distancing restrictions. And I'll be letting you know about that very soon after our drive-in service. He said, well, why aren't you doing it now? Because I know how it can get. It can get a little confusing as to what we're doing which Sunday. So as soon as our Sunday service is over, I'm going to give you all the information about what it means to come to church. We'll have two services on Sunday that you'll have the option of coming to so that we can accommodate everybody. And we will have some things in play uh, for everybody, including those families that have babies or small children. And uh, so we've got all that together. You got to work with us. We'll work with you. Be patient. Uh, this, you know, I would look back in the history of our country to see how other pastors did it. This has been unprecedented. So we're just kind of going at it together. And, uh, and I know that we're trying to do the best that we can to both obey the Lord and to submit to the authorities that the Lord has put over us. So pray with us about that. And uh, we are uh, doing our best to get everything ready for you. But I am excited about Sunday. We want you here. Roll those windows down. You'll be six feet apart from everybody. And you got to remain in your vehicle, though. All that's there for you. you got to stay in your, in your car, okay? And uh, so I don't want you to blow up an air mattress and put it in your parking space. That doesn't count, okay? We need you to be in your vehicle. Now, if you can fit an air mattress in your vehicle... Well, that's another story. Okay, we'll allow that. But I'm just saying you have to stay in your car. And, uh, and man, I can't wait to see you. And it'll be fun. It'll be a fun experience to preach outside. I, I'm trying to think of the last time I preached outside other than to my kids when they were playing and I was trying to teach them about what it meant to obey the Lord. But anyway, um, we, uh, we're looking forward to it. I know it's going to be a great experiment. If it fails, we'll all fail together. Amen. If I'm going down... I'm taking you with me. Amen. All right. Very good. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings. And then we're going to get right into the word of God tonight. Once again, we do have our next installment of the Cause Connection that will be available on Friday. I believe that we'll have our next lesson for uh, our uh, young uh, Savior Sheep. I believe tomorrow. Is that right, Miss Katie? Tomorrow morning. And uh, so that will be available for you as well, kids. So all the content, we'd encourage you. I know that Brother Caleb put out his next Crossroads video today. And so Crossroads, I'd encourage you to go and look at that. And I know many of our adults have been blessed by that as well. And I'd encourage you to take the time. Those messages are not long. I'd encourage you to, to if you can watch an episode of The Office, you can watch the Word of God being taught and preached. Amen. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessings over our time together tonight and then we will set our timer and get into the word of God. Thank you for being here. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time once again that you've given us. Lord, we lift up these special prayer needs to you. I, I continue to pray for Brother Tim's mom. Lord, I pray that she would, that having good days would, uh, Lord, just be the norm, that she'd have more good than bad. And I pray that you'd continue to guide the doctors with her treatment. I thank you for the good report on Lindsay. And Lord, I pray that she would have no setbacks, that she would continue healing. I pray for Miss Janet Dilly, Lord. Uh, I can't imagine that, that prognosis, Lord about brain cancer. I know that you are the great physician and you are in control of everything that goes on. And Lord, you certainly have the power to heal her. And until you tell us otherwise, that's how we'll believe. So we know that you have the ability to do that. And I pray, Lord, that you again would guide the doctors in handling uh, her situation. I pray for what we've got going on this weekend. Uh, it'll be different than what we've done these past two months. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us. I pray it go well. I pray there would not be any 
unnecessary complication. And Lord, I pray that we get to see our church family uh, here on Sunday together once again. Uh, as wonderful as these live stream services have been, it's just not the same of being able to assemble together. Can't wait to be with them. Lord, I pray that you bring everyone here together and that it be a special time. Thank you for what you're going to do tonight in your word. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, turn your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and then Romans chapter 7. We are in part 3, once again, of our study. We didn't get very far, but we've been talking about experiencing freedom in Christ. And we talked about the conflict. Uh, man is made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And as we continue in the flesh, which has been crucified with Christ, we know that the flesh still wants to have dominion, still wants to have power, although we have the ability to let the mind of Christ be in us. Every person that's a child of God has the mind of Christ available to them, but whether or not we allow it to rule and, and us to submit to it is up to us. Now here in Philippians chapter 2, once again, I bet you can say it together. Try to say it with me without looking at your Bibles, at least verse 5. You ready? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Very good. I'm assuming that you did that with me. Verse number six says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Let me turn my timer on here. Very good. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're talking about this freedom that we have, this, uh, this peace that passeth all understanding, and especially in the times that we live in today, Boy, peace would be nice, wouldn't it? Peace of mind would be nice. The Bible says that we have peace with God, according to Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1. And so he has given us then the ability to have the peace of God while we're going through life. And I'm thankful for it, aren't you? I, I tell you, honestly, every single thing that we read, everything that we hear, I mean, everybody's sharing videos as if it's gospel, which always cracks me up. All of a sudden now, oh, good. We've got a, the latest video on YouTube that explains everything. That always makes me laugh because I think to myself, well, how do we know they're the authority? I, I always think that's humorous to me. Now, obviously, we know that somewhere in, in the middle of all that we're reading, of all that we're hearing is probably the truth, right? But who's to say? So in the midst of all this turmoil and chaos and destruction and death, we can rely upon the peace of God and know that everything that's going on in this world has nothing to do with our freedom that's in Christ, the liberty that the Lord has given us. He is not surprised by 2020. He is not, uh, certainly in the times that we live in, as bad as it is, I always think about, to myself, I still was able to go to Chick-fil-A today and get lunch. I mean, as bad as it is, it certainly could be so much worse, couldn't it? As bad as it is for you to listen to me, listen, we've, we've learned this on Wednesday nights. Remember, church? It could be worse, amen? <laughs> and we've heard worse, don't we? So let's go over to uh, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, once again, is a review and look at the conflict that the Apostle Paul had. And what we said last week was that if the Apostle Paul had this conflict that he, that he felt within him between allowing the mind of Christ to rule him versus his flesh... Versus his brain. I always like that comparison is mind versus his brain, right? The flesh versus the spirit. If he struggled with that, well, Lord knows you and I will too. And notice what it says here in Romans chapter 7 and verse number uh, 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, that's my flesh, warring against the law of my mind 
and bringing me into captivity. What do we have in Christ? We have freedom in Christ. We have captivity in the flesh. The mind of Christ, freedom. The mind of man, bondage. Notice, to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I always think it's funny when I read these, these wealth and health preachers, all the wonderful things that they say about you. I am healthy. I am good. Right? I am wonderful. Right? All these different things that try to make you feel good about yourself. You know what Paul said? I am wretched. That's what he said. You know, I think I'm going to take his perspective over 2020 Christianity. What do you think? It says here, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who shall deliver him from the body of death? We're wretched in our flesh. Dwelleth no good thing, he says. Only Christ can do that. Only Christ can give us that freedom. So with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. So we talked about that disoriented, that disordered mind, didn't we? And, and how to, to learn how to prioritize our thinking. We must, and I said this last week, we must be purposeful. We must have an urgency in the thoughts that we allow to enter into our mind. Because remember, ungodly thinking leads to ungodly living. Godly thinking leads to a holy life. And that's what we're talking about today. So Paul says the only hope that he has to set his mind free is to have the mind of Christ, is the Lord Jesus Christ, and to end that pattern of disorder in his life. So how can then the Lord clean up the disorder of our mind? How can he keep us having the mind of peace and the mind of joy in this crooked and perverse nation? How? Well, first, we have to purposefully give the Lord control of our will. That's what we're talking about here today. Now, our mind has already been submitted to his. Okay, so remember, we said thinking leads to action. And so then we have to surrender our will. Remember, the Bible says we have to reckon ourselves dead. Remember, we've been crucified with Christ, haven't we? And I always think about those two thieves that were crucified with the Lord. And you remember the Bible says at first they both railed upon him. And then the thief on the cross that we always hear about, then he began to speak righteously and to see things from the proper perspective, putting God on the throne. Lord, remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom, right? But notice at first, even though they're crucified with Christ, they're still making railing accusations against him. So the same thing with us. The Bible says we have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless we live. So there is a war, just like a crucifixion victim. He doesn't die immediately, does he? Uh, for hours and, and for some days, they anguished on the cross. And every now and then, what do they do? They would lift themselves up, get air, and, and talk. And That's such a great picture of what the Christian deals with. Yes, we're crucified with Christ, but Romans 6 tells us that even though we're crucified with, with Christ, we still have the potential to abound in sin. <laughs> so what do we do? We have to reckon ourselves does. We have to consider that sin has no more dominion over us, and so our flesh doesn't run the show. And Paul says, well, the flesh isn't going to like that. And the flesh is going to try over and over again to assert its authority. And so that's what we're talking about. We've got to submit to the will of God. And then second, we've got to come to the point where we choose to deny our desires that are in conflict with God's desires. Okay? We have to understand, first of all, what our desires are. We've got to be honest with ourselves. And then understand what God's desires are. And anything that conflicts with God desires for our life, we've got to get rid of it. That's how we clean up the disorder of our mind. I always like the little acronym that we have. We, we call it LIGHT. L-I-G-H-T, right? Not L-I-T-E like some of us text, right? L-I-G-H-T. This is a great little system uh, that, I, that I've read about that I really liked here about how to give Christ... Uh, authority over your will, and then how to get rid of those desires that conflict. So I want you to see first, make a list of desires. Remember, we're talking about now, we're not talking about just, you know, arbitrarily living the Christian life. We're talking about purposeful thinking. That's important. 
Because I think a lot of times, the Bible says we have to bring into captivity our imagination, anything that, that would exalt itself above the knowledge of God. So we have to be purposeful. We can't just assume that it's going to happen. We determine what we think. You know, I always, we, I always tell Miss Katie this, that when I get to the office in the morning, I always, you know, there's so many little fires that I have hands in, you know, so many little things that I have to do. And I literally have a schedule that I print out every single day of little hour and half hour increments. And I write them out. You know, I have a staff meeting and, and, uh, and Miss Courtney, I, I, she has a planner where she reminds me of things that I might not remember. Boy, I'll write that in. Oh, I got to get that. Boy, I'll write that in this little half hour increment. And I do it that way because what happens? Well, if I'm just trying to go at it, boy, there's something that's going to be left behind because I'm going to forget something. And so in order for my time to be as effective as it can be as pastor, I've got to write out projects. I've got to write out time slots or else they won't get done. So the same thing with our thinking. If we just think, well, I'll tell you what, one of these days I'm going to start thinking right, and then you don't do anything about it to get to that place, it will never get right. You have to bring into captivity your thoughts. So I would encourage you that if you're struggling with these things, to make literally a list of desires. Now, for me to think that somebody is actually going to do this, I would like to think somebody would if they're struggling with this. But I'd encourage you, don't just dismiss what we're saying here. Make a list of your desires. That's going to be an ongoing process in your life. Get you a diary, get you a journal, get you something that you can have that's just yours, that is between you and the Lord, and you can even make a little code system just in case it gets into the wrong hands, right? And only you know it, you and the Lord know it. And make yourself a list of honest desires. So that's the L. And then I, identify the desires that conflict, not, not yet with God's desire, but with other desires, right? You want a boat, but you also want to be able to pay your mortgage, right? So that might conflict, right? You want to go on a vacation, but you also like to eat this week. You know, so look at these things that might conflict with each other. And then I want you to see uh, the, the G, uh, pray that Christ will help you get rid of desires that are in conflict with God's desires for your life. You know, you think about um, that we are such a, a materialistic culture, and we think about, uh, well, I, you know, I'd really love to go fishing on Sundays. You know, Sunday's my only day off. But I also know that I have a responsibility to go to church. So in that case, you have a desire. I'd like to go fishing on Sundays. I know God wants me to be at church. So pray that God will take away that desire. And then, you know what he'll do? It's an amazing thing. He'll open up a door for you to go some other time. It's an amazing thing. When you seek first the kingdom of God, all these other things have a tendency to be added unto you. I'm not talking about evil desires. I'm just talking about desires in general. Things that you want to do with your life. Things that you see. And then uh, pray that Christ, here's the H, will help you have his desires. Lord, give me a desire to see somebody saved that I work with. Lord, put within me the desire to tell somebody about you. You know what will happen? You'll be real surprised. He'll do it. <laughs> God, help me to want to be a good father. Help me to want to be a good husband. He'll do it. He'll put those desires in you. And then the T, take action. Right? You can't just say, well, I prayed, that's it. Ah, no, take action. Do what you need to do to follow Christ's desire rather than your own. Right? And say, so, well, you know, that may require you not to get on the bass boat, you know, on Sunday, right? It may require you to say, you know, I don't want to work my schedule around. You know, we put out a calendar every single year and we put things out. And I know not many of you, right? A lot of people say you do. Yeah, right. But maybe a couple of you do. You plan a year out or a year and a half out. But we put things very clear when we're doing things. Vacation Bible school, uh, youth camp, uh, fifth Sunday fellowships. We, we, you know, we don't do that for just, you know, because, you know, we put all these things out in the church, all these activities, all these things that we plan because we know how important it is for us to dwell together in unity, for us to fellowship together, right? And so many of you don't have a desire to do that. And so it doesn't matter what we put on the calendar. 
You'll just do and go wherever you want to go. You know what you say? You know what? I know that's not right. I know that I need, if I'm going to help edify one another and provoke one another to good works, I need to be here. So here's what you do. If you don't have a desire to be here, hey, how about you pray that God will give you that desire? And then watch this. Then you got to take action. Then when we do have something, you know what's going to be an amazing thing? If you'll come and surrender and work, you'll actually enjoy yourself. And you have taken action to allow the desires that God wants for your life to be more important than your desires. And then you know what will happen? Then God's desires for your life are going to become your desires. It's an amazing thing. Then all of a sudden you won't take vacations from church. Then all of a sudden you'll try to, what you can to work your schedule around to where you can be here for at least one of those two services for the week, right? You'll go to bed earlier on Saturday so that you can be ready to go for Sunday school. Things that were not important to you now become important to you because you've made a list of your desires. You've seen the things that conflict with God's desires for your life. You've prayed and asked God to give you the desires of God to be the desires of you. And then you've taken action. You've actually been aggressive to make the desires of God your desires. See how that works? See, you're not going to develop that freedom that comes uh, with allowing the mind of Christ to rule you just by saying the words. It's not a magical formula. The Lord gives you a personal responsibility to cast down those imaginations and everything that would exalt itself above the knowledge of God. You've got to do it, right? Right? You know, we, don't have, we, sh we shouldn't have to teach uh, serving God 101, right? It's going to be a natural result of what your desire is. Somebody the other day said, you know what? I realized I didn't have a good excuse not to join the choir, so I joined the choir this year. I like that. This was a young man that was being discipled, and I believe that the two were directly related it was an amazing thing, and, and he knows what I'm talking about. He's probably watching it right now, that he was, he was going through discipleship. The Lord was working on his heart, going through the Word of God, and then all of a sudden, when it comes time to sign up for stuff, this is what he said. Well, I've got time for this. I've got to sign up for this. Yep, I can do that. Yep, I can do that. I don't have a reason not to do that. <laughs> he's just signing up for things. I love that. You know what's happening? As he's allowing the Word of God to dwell in him richly, God's desires are becoming his desires. Do you see how important that is? So that's what we're talking about, making a list of your desires. Now, so if you've got your little journal, if you've got your little notebook and you're making your desires, make a, a list of the good ones and the ones that are bad. Sure, be honest with yourself. The exercise of knowing what your desires are is going to do no good unless you're honest with yourself. So make everything that you can think of that you want and then evaluate the desires that are causing conflict with God's desires for your life. Pray and ask God, God, help me not only to be honest with you, but help me to be honest with myself. Write down everything that comes into your mind. And then look at it. Look at the list and see if, you know, number four versus number one. You know, look at those lists. Notice those things that are in conflict with each other. And then when you do that, when you're identifying those things that are in conflict, then guess what? The Lord will help you with those things and will set you free. How? Remember? Let's go over to James. We looked at this last week. James chapter 4. From whence come wars and fightings among you. Remember we talked about that disordered mind. Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members. Romans chapter 7. Remember, there are two types of wisdom that are trying to control the show, aren't they? Look back in chapter 3 because we're going to really look at it. Can't wait to get there. Only have about 12 minutes. So let's look at it. Look on down in verse number 13 of chapter 3. James 3, 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if he have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Remember we said the three enemies of the child of God while he's living in this earth are the world. We don't talk about, you know, we're not talking about the trees, right? 
We're not talking about the grass. We're not talking about the mountains. All right. We're not, we're not talking about the snow leopard. What are we talking about? We're talking about the world system, aren't we? The course of this world. And then sensual, that's the flesh. That's the, the things we can touch, see, feel here. And then devilish, Satan himself. And we're, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. That confusion of the mind, clouding your thinking. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. There's that peaceful mind when we allow the wisdom that is from above versus the wisdom that is from the earth. Okay? So, with that said, remember, what did Paul say there in Romans chapter 7? Christ will create in you the desire to be like him. So if you feel like today, well, you know, I don't really think about it, really. That's the problem. You're, remember, you're supposed to take captive. Take captive those imaginary, bring into captivity. So what's the opposite? Well, then those thoughts just have freedom in your life to, to lure you and and to steer you in what a direction, as long as it's not of God. See, a lot of times Satan will put thoughts and actions in your life, will not tempt you to do things that are that are blatantly evil, right? He doesn't care. He doesn't care whether you're going to the to the club on Sunday morning or whether you're out there fishing, just as long as you're not in church. You with me? Doesn't necessarily have to be wicked for it to be, listen for it to tempt you away from the wisdom that's from above. That's what we're talking about. Christ creates you in you the desire to be like him. Christ begins to give you desires for the things that he wants. He will put that desire in you. So well, how can he do it? Well, but remember what we said? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So if you want to think like Christ thinks, then guess what? Christ begins to give you the desires of the things that he wants. Then... Number three, Christ's desires within you will enable the Father to work in your life. It always makes me laugh when I think we think about carnal Christians. Carnal Christians are those that, that are saved, but they act like they're still in the world. How, how can the Father use him? How can the Father communicate with him? How is the Father going to have anything to do with him? He's just like the prodigal son that leaves his father's presence, and then what does he do? He spends his inheritance. You know, as we have the desires of Christ, the Father can use us. He'll enable us. It won't be like Demas, having loved this present world, forsaking Paul. Then notice number four, God's goal for, is for you to experience Christ's fullness so that Christ becomes your life. For Christ who is our life, Corinthians says. And then number five, you grow in having godly desires by seeking God's will above all other things. So no matter what you, you, you'll get to the point where I really like this, but then it won't be, ah, I got to give this up. It'll be like, you know what? Before I even go in that direction, what does God want for my life? And every, your, everything will change. Everything in your life will change. And then I want you to see Christ wants you to share his wants. Christ wants you to share his wants. So we, we, we have told you the, the what. So let's talk about the how. So what do you do? Well, there are normally three ways of thinking. <laughs> Pardon the pun, right? Which of the following best describes what needs to happen for us to be set free? Number one, this is what a lot of people think. Listen, if just give me an approved list of desires that's found in the Bible. Where is what I can desire found in God's Word, and then I'll just memorize that and live by that, right? That's why, what, what's so popular today? Well, I'll live by the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And it's not even said like that, specifically in the Scripture. But a lot of people do that. Just give me a list. Give me a list. That's what I need to do. I'll just follow the Ten Commandments. Okay? So that's one option. You can tell even by my tone that that's not going to happen. All right? Then number two. I sit back and wait for God to change me and to be everything He wants me to be. And I'm not going to do anything until then. I'm just going to sit back. Woo! And let it happen. Obviously, that's not right. Number three, Christ encourages me to be like him. 
I release my desires and allow him to give me his. So think about that. God doesn't automatically change you. Poof, right? It's not going to just happen without any action on your part. He doesn't violate your decision making or your free will. He doesn't do that. You have to make the conscious decision whether or not you're going to be involved in the process. You have to choose that. And folks, because I know that this is confusing, that is why you have people that are brought up in church that live as if they've not had a day of church. And then you've got the same people who have been there for less time doing more for the Lord. Why is that? Because number two doesn't work. You can't just feel like, well, I'll tell you what I did my duty. I just came to church and sat in my pew. Didn't have anything to do with that. Because you have to be purposeful. There's a lot of people, man, if I were to ask people and hunker them down when they leave uh, the service, tell me what I preached on today. Uh, right? Why? Because they're there, but they're just sitting back. Maybe thinking God's going to do something without any work on their own. It doesn't work that way. How many of you can be listening? You know somebody's talking, but your mind has wandered, and then before you know it, you just don't realize what they said. My wife does that. Uh, she'll be talking to me, and, and I have a bad habit of being distracted, and I, I hear her voice. I hear it. This was not a good example of my wife. I, I, fear I might have gotten in trouble just then. But she, I'll hear her talking, and I know words are coming out of her mouth, but before I know it, I've just missed like two sentences. Isn't that something? You have to be purposeful. You have to stop and think, you know what I do now? I set my phone down and I look at her in the eyes. And you know what's amazing about that? Then I hear what she's saying, not just with my ears. That's what we're talking about. So you've got to be involved in the process. And then you can't do it all by yourself. As long as I have a list, I'm going to memorize this list right here. Dun, 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 dun. One through 10, boom, I've got it. No, it's not all by yourself either. So it's not just letting God do all the work in you and you're just going to sit back and relax. And it's not, I'm doing all the work and God has nothing to do with it. So it's somewhere in between that, isn't it? It's number three. Christ takes the initiative to cause you to be like him. But you have to allow the mind of Christ to control your will. That's what we're talking about. Christ gives you a new set of desires when you submit to his authority in your life. And I, you know what I love? Christ's desires for you will never conflict with themselves like ours does. Ours will. You know, we have desires that we want for our life, and you will be able to see if you actually took the time to list them, there'll be things that will conflict with each other. But with Christ, when he gives you desire, everything's going to line up, and he'll give you that inner peace. So that's what we're talking about. You remember we talked about the characteristics of the mind of Christ in six places in the New Testament back there in, oh, I don't know, week seven, week six. I don't remember. But the first one was what? Alive. Having the mind of Christ to be spiritually minded is what? Life, Romans chapter eight tells us. Life and peace. And so we, we looked at those characteristics of the Christ-like mind. So to be spiritually minded, that means having the mind, of course, of Christ through the Holy Spirit of God that lives within us. Remember, people without the Holy Ghost are spiritually dead. The natural man receiveth not the things of God, neither can he know him because they are, what? Spiritually discerned. So we have to have that mind that's alive in the Spirit. So let's look at that. that let's do an exercise here. Go over to Romans. We only got a couple of minutes left. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. This passage describes spiritual life versus spiritual death. We're talking about having the mind of Christ, well, and we're talking about the alive mind. Well, there are characteristics of our thinking that show that we are having a living mind, that we're having an alive mind. So how do we do that? Well, let's look at it here in the text. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 1. Therefore, it, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. So if you live after the flesh, let me ask you this, would that be life or death? Death. The wages of sin is death. But after the Spirit. 
So to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Living after the Spirit would be what? Life. So you see what we have here. For the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. He showed us it could be done. You could have victory over the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. It always cracks me up. Folks that are clearly living in the flesh, and they'll have their little tagline, you know how you can have on your social media page, like who you are. Well, a lot of times, you know what they do? And I laugh at it. They'll say, God first. <laughs> God first. When I know they're living in sin. When they're living in the flesh. But it, and it even shocks me sometimes, people that I never even knew believed in God. God is not first in your life if there is no fruit to walking and living in the Spirit. If you have an alive mind, what, what's it going to show? Righteousness. Holiness. Going after the things of God, not the things of the flesh. You can't get mad at me. I didn't say that. Paul said it right here in Romans chapter 8. And the scripture, God cannot lie. Let's continue. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Remember what we said, Christ wants you to have his desires. Why? For peace, for joy, for that abundant life, not to harm you, not to hurt you, not to do you ill will, but to help you, to help your journey. Because the carnal mind is enmity with God. See, you're never going to have that right relationship with the Lord when you're allowing your mind to be affected by the flesh. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. God's not first in your life. God's not pleased with your life when you're living for your flesh. I don't know how it can be any clearer. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Remember, we all have the mind of Christ. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. So, when we allow our flesh to control us, you're allowing a dead thing to run your life. It's already been crucified with Christ. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by a spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Got no control over you. But if ye, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have, ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby ye cry, Abba, Father. Remember, submitting to the Father's will. The only other time that phrase, Abba, Father, is found, I'm probably getting ahead of myself, is over there in the book of Mark where the Lord Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was surrendering to the will of God to be crucified for the sin of mankind that's what it means to have the mind of christ submitting to the father's plan even when it's not your plan wow and you have that special tender relationship with the lord abba father that you cannot have if you're trying to please your flesh instead For the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of god this isn't always the case but many times people have a hard time believing that, that they're eternally secure because they continue to live for sin. One of the greatest evidences of eternal security is conviction. Isn't that something? The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we may suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. A lot of times people don't believe that they're the sons of God. They don't believe that they're eternally saved because they don't act like it and they don't feel like it. And they don't see any fruits of it. So this is what we're talking about today. Bondage to fear, Paul describes, death. Carnally minded, death. Enmity against God, death. 
mortifying the deeds of the body. That's life. Righteousness, life, sin, death, in the spirit, life, led by the spirit, life, living after the flesh, death, the spirit of adoption, life, be spiritually minded, life, walk after the spirit, life, over and over, that freedom that comes in Christ, we are spiritually alive, you have no freedom if you're dead, you with me? But boy, you have all the freedom in the world if you're living for the plan God has for your life. When you're free in Christ, you're free to live to the fullest sense of the world. Spiritual life is not the absence of death, listen, but the presence of life. The presence of Christ in you. When you allow Christ to make Him like yourself, listen, or to make you like Himself, I should say, He sets you free to fully live. That's what real living is all about. And I hope today that you have that desire to allow the mind of Christ to give you the freedom that you've been looking for. Well, we're going to conclude this section, and I can't wait to dissect James chapter 3 when we get back together next week. So thankful that you have joined us here tonight, and I hope that you will get to experience the freedom that comes with allowing the mind of Christ to rule in your life. That's my prayer for you. That I know that's the Lord's desire for you. All right, be praying about what we've got going on this Sunday. And uh, we encourage you to come to our drive-in service. We're excited to see what God is going to do. Can't wait to preach outside. Can't wait to see our church family again, even in this temporary setting. We're looking forward to it. We love you, church, and we'll see you next time. God bless you.